Hi everybody and welcome to our module on obstructive lung disease. In the module on pulmonary function testing, I discussed the differences between obstructive and restrictive disease in terms of lung volumes and PFTs. But let me just highlight a couple of the key points here. In obstructive disease, you have air trapped inside the lungs because it can't get out. You also have slow flow of air going out and therefore less air going out in total. This means that you're going to have a reduced forced expiratory volume in the first second, and this is because of that slow flow out due to obstruction. You also have a reduced force vital capacity because there's less air that you're pushing out with each breath. And then the hallmark of obstructive disease is a reduced FEV1 to FVC because the FEV1 falls more than the FVC so that this ratio gets lower. One other point before I go on to discuss specific causes of obstructive lung disease, and that point is on residual volume and total lung volume or total lung capacity. We don't normally measure these because they're very difficult to determine clinically, but if you were to measure them, you'd find that both go up in obstructive disease, and this is from air trapping. You can think of the lungs as a big balloon and the whole bronchial tree as the outlet of that balloon. And if you get an obstruction to outflow, this means that with each exhalation, less air goes out. So slowly over time, volume builds up and that balloon gets bigger and bigger. This means you have a bigger residual volume left in the lung at the end of each breath. It also means you have an increased total lung capacity, and that's sometimes confusing. You think with lung disease, you'd have less lung capacity, but you actually have more in obstructive disease, even though less is going out with each breath. And make sure that's clear in your mind. The opposite of this is true in restrictive disease. Both of these numbers fall in restrictive disease and that's because there's a restriction so that balloon of the lungs just can't fill as much to bring air in and therefore if you were to measure the total capacity you'd find it smaller than normal and the residual volume is also smaller than normal. Now we're going to talk about specific causes of obstructive lung disease and there are four that you need to know chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, and bronchiectasis. So first we'll talk about chronic bronchitis, and this condition has a completely clinical definition. It's an arbitrary clinical definition that was decided on years ago, but it's been used in clinical trials and it's always stuck, and we continue to define the disease this way. So to say that someone has chronic bronchitis, they have to have a chronic cough that's productive of sputum for at least three months over two years with no other cause of cough present. And you should know that chronic bronchitis, like other forms of obstructive lung disease we'll talk about, is strongly associated with smoking. In chronic bronchitis, you get hypertrophy of the mucus secreting glands, and this means there's going to be a lot of mucus and a lot of phlegm. And you can actually define how severe the disease is by something called the Reed Index. So in the bronchial wall, you have an epithelial layer with epithelial cells here. Then you have a layer with some mucus glands in it. And then finally, there's a layer of cartilage along the bottom. Now, normally, this mucus layer here is about 0.4 or so of the total thickness of the bronchial wall. When it gets to be greater than 0.5, that starts to define severe chronic bronchitis, and it can get very high in smokers with severe lung disease. And obviously, the thicker this entire wall gets, the more it obstructs the flow of air. And the read index is something that's usually determined post-mortem. When somebody dies from lung disease, they go and study their tissue at autopsy and find out how thick this glandular layer was in the bronchial wall. So as I said, the Reed index is thickness of glands to the total wall, and a ratio of greater than about 50% defines chronic bronchitis. Another thing that can happen to patients with this condition is that the lungs can plug with mucus. This is called mucus plugging, and this shuts off portions of the lung to ventilation. In addition, there is an increased risk of infection, and people with chronic bronchitis often get pulmonary infections. So the physiologic consequences of chronic bronchitis are that you have poor ventilation of the lungs. This means the level of carbon dioxide will rise in the blood and the level of oxygen will fall. Because you have a low level of oxygen, you can get hypoxic vasoconstriction in the lungs, and this can lead to pulmonary hypertension, and if it's untreated, it can eventually lead to right heart failure from core pulmonale. Signs and symptoms you can see in someone with chronic bronchitis are cough from all that phlegm, wheezing from the airway obstruction, crackles from the extra mucus, dyspnea from the poor ventilation, and then finally you can see cyanosis from shunting. Let me discuss shunting in a little more detail. I discuss this at length in some of the physiology modules. To understand shunting, let's consider a situation where we have two alveoli, one on the left side of the screen right here and one on the right side of the screen right here. And both alveoli have an associated capillary that's carrying blood past the alveolus to pick up oxygen. Now let's assume that this alveolus on the left becomes plugged with mucus from chronic bronchitis and therefore it does not fill with air and oxygen. What's going to happen in this situation is blood will flow past the alveolus that's healthy and become 99% saturated with oxygen.
blood that flows past the alveolus on the left does not become 99% saturated. It becomes hypoxemic. Its concentration of oxygen may get so low that it may even be about 60% saturated, which is what venous blood can be. The result is when the two streams mix, you get hypoxemia, and that is the mechanism of shunting causing hypoxemia, and that's what happens in chronic bronchitis. Now, you should note here that if you were to give this patient 100% oxygen, it would not help. The blood on the right side of the screen here is already maximally saturated with oxygen. It can't pick up anymore, and the blood on the left side of the screen here is not flowing past a working alveolus to pick up any O2. Now in reality, we give oxygen to patients with chronic bronchitis all the time, and it does help. However, you should know that the more shunt physiology that they have, the less the oxygen helps. Shunting is really a theoretical mechanism of what's going on at the alveolus level. It can be going on to various degrees in any particular patient who has chronic bronchitis. The next cause of obstructive lung disease we'll discuss is emphysema. So in emphysema, you get tissue destruction inside the alveoli. So why does this happen? Well, a very important concept for you to understand is that at all times inside your lungs, there is a balance between two groups of enzymes. One group is called the proteases, and the other is called the antiproteases. And when these are in healthy balance, you get healthy lungs without tissue destruction. However, if you get too many proteases or too few antiproteases, you will begin to have destruction of the alveoli, and that's what happens in emphysema. So the most common type of emphysema is the type we see in smokers. The smoke creates proteases, and these overwhelm the antiproteases, and as a result, the lungs get damaged. And the damage that occurs in smoker's emphysema is predominantly in the upper lobes. And an easy way to remember this is to just think of smoke rising up to the upper lobes of the lungs. The second type of emphysema is very rare. It's in patients who have a rare condition called antitrypsin deficiency. They have ineffective antiproteases, and as a result, they get emphysema, and their emphysema is predominantly in the lower lobes. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. So as I said, in emphysema, you get destruction of the alveoli. In the more common type, the smoker's type, the smoke activates macrophages. This leads to recruitment of neutrophils, and then you get production and release of proteases, which overwhelm the antiproteases. When you lose alveoli, you lose the elastic recoil of the lungs, and this is what leads to obstruction. This is going to cause the small airways to collapse when you exhale and air to get trapped in the lungs. This is easier to understand with a picture, so let's draw a little bronchus and then an alveoli here. So when you exhale, there are forces pushing down on this bronchus, but it remains open because there is some elastic recoil of the alveoli here. When the alveoli get destroyed in emphysema, you lose that elastic recoil. As a result, when you exhale, the bronchus is going to collapse, and you're going to get air left behind and trapped inside here. And this leads to the physiology of obstructive lung disease. The clinical findings of emphysema are dyspnea and cough, much like chronic bronchitis, although there tends to be less sputum than chronic bronchitis. There's hyperventilation. Because those alveoli are destroyed, there's less area for gas exchange, so the patient will hyperventilate to try and get the remaining functional alveoli to do more work and keep the oxygen level up. Because of the hyperventilation, patients can lose weight. They're burning more energy and more calories. And then over time, the hypoxia can lead to core pulmonary and heart failure. And another classic finding of emphysema is the barrel chest. This is an x-ray of someone with a barrel chest over here on the right. And that's from all the air trapping due to the emphysema and the obstructive physiology. Let me review an important term for understanding emphysema, and that's called the acinus. This is a word that means berry, and the acinus in the lungs is the bronchiole plus an alveoli, so this is an example of one right here. Smokers who get emphysema get sentry acinar damage, so they tend to have damage to sort of the branch portion here and less damage to the alveoli. Patients who have antitrypsin deficiency get what's called pan acinar damage, so they tend to have damage to this entire structure here. And it's very high yield to know that smokers get sentry acinar, it's sometimes called sentry lobular damage, and antitrypsin patients get pan acinar or pan lobular damage. In the top left here is a tissue specimen of a patient with emphysema, and the key findings are that there are big white spaces and that there's lots of white space here. In addition, the septa between the air spaces is very thin compared to normal, and thin septa and large air spaces are the findings in emphysema. Down here on the left is an example of a smoker's lung. They have these black spots, which are sometimes called dirty holes, and those are evidence of central lobular damage from smoking. And then over here on the right is another example of hyperinflated lungs in a patient who has emphysema.
To help you better understand the concept of the barrel chest, let's review this graph of chest volumes and pressures. And I go over this at length in some of the other physiology modules. But for our purposes here, recall that the FRC is the functional residual capacity. That's the volume that the lungs settle on after a quiet breath. And it's the point where this green line crosses the zero pressure mark. And at the FRC, the pressures and forces in the lungs are balanced so that the tendency of the chest wall to expand outwards is balanced by the tendency of the lungs to collapse inwards. In patients with emphysema, the blue line for the lungs changes to look like this. This means that the FRC is going to move up. The point where those forces are going to be balanced is now higher up. Thus, you have a higher volume at the end of a quiet breath, and that's why you get the barrel chest. That's the visual representation on this chart of the air trapping that occurs in emphysema. There's a classic description of the different appearances of patients with chronic bronchitis versus emphysema that you should know, and this is called the blue bloater and the pink puffer. So patients with chronic bronchitis are called the blue bloaters. They have cyanosis from that shunting mechanism I described, and this makes them blue, and then they have air trapped, and this makes them bloated. Patients with emphysema, on the other hand, are the pink puffers. They've lost alveoli, so they've lost surface area for oxygen absorption. So they're hyperventilating to compensate. This is why they're puffers. And initially, this maintains their O2 level and makes them pink. Now, in reality, this classification isn't of that much value because most patients have some elements of both. But you should be aware of this classic description. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and this is the term we use to describe chronic bronchitis and emphysema in the modern era. It turns out that patients rarely have just chronic bronchitis or just emphysema. They almost always have elements of both, and both are smoker's diseases and both have the same treatment, so therefore clinically you'll hear people call them COPD. Now technically COPD also includes asthma, but asthma has its own set of treatments. So usually patients with asthma are called asthma patients and patients with chronic bronchitis or emphysema are called COPD patients. Next, let's discuss alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So recall that most emphysema comes from smoking, but there is a very rare form caused by deficiency of antitrypsins. This is an inherited disease, and people who have this condition have decreased or dysfunctional antitrypsins. And remember that the antitrypsins balance the naturally occurring proteases in the lungs. The most important of these is elastase, which is found in neutrophils and alveolar macrophages, and it's always present to a small degree in the lungs. As long as you have antitrypsin around, it won't cause any damage, but if you you lose your antitrypsin, then it can cause lung damage. People with this condition get problems in both the lung and the liver. So in the lungs, they get pan acinar emphysema. And remember, that's different from smoker's emphysema, which is centri acinar. They have an imbalance between neutrophil elastase, which destroys elastin, and the antitrypsin, which protects the elastin. And as a result, they get lower lung damage. And remember, this is also different from smokers who get upper lung damage. A second problem people with antitrypsin deficiency have is liver cirrhosis. So abnormal alpha-1 can build up in the liver. This is only going to occur in certain subtypes of this disease where people get polymerization of the antitrypsin in the hepatocytes and it leads to hepatocyte death. So there are some patients who have severe antitrypsin deficiency with lung problems but no hepatocyte accumulation. But you definitely should know and it's high yield for step one to know that the liver can be involved from polymerization of the antitrypsin in the hepatocytes. So the classic case of antitrypsin deficiency you should know for your boards is a patient with typical COPD symptoms like cough and sputum and wheezing, but usually they're relatively young. So most patients who get COPD from smoking are in their 60s or 70s. This will be someone who's in their 40s or maybe even younger. On imaging, there'll be emphysematous changes that are most prominent at the base, and on pulmonary function testing, they'll have obstructive physiology. And the question often asks about pan ACE in our involvement, so make sure you remember that. And then one thing to know about antitrypsin deficiency is these patients should never smoke. So they have no antitrypsin activity, so the last thing they want to do is smoke and stimulate the neutrophil elastase production. This can be disastrous. Next cause of obstructive lung disease is asthma. This is reversible bronchoconstriction, and reversible is the key word as opposed to COPD. This tends to go back to normal after the acute episode is over. It's usually due to some type of allergic stimulus. It's an example of a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And the airways in patients with asthma are hyper-responsive, so they tend to overreact to stimulus and bronchoconstrict. It's common in children. When you do pediatrics rotations, you'll see many kids with asthma. And it's often associated with other allergic or atopic conditions. So the kids who have asthma often also have allergic rhinitis or eczema. They may even have a family history of other allergic reactions.
Figuring out the triggers for asthma is an important part of helping patients with the condition. If they can figure out what triggers their bronchoconstriction, then they can just avoid it and they won't get sick. So some common triggers are, first of all, an upper respiratory infection. It's very common for kids with asthma to get a cold and then have an asthma exacerbation. Allergens like animal dander and dust mites and mold and pollen can trigger asthma. So can stress and exercise and cold. And then finally, there's an important but relatively rare subclass of asthma called aspirin exacerbated disease that we'll talk about now. So there's a rare subtype of asthma called aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And these are patients with asthma who get symptoms triggered by taking aspirin or NSAIDs. They usually have a chronic triad of asthma, chronic sinusitis, and polyps in their nasal passages. So in terms of symptoms, they're going to have recurrent chronic asthma and also runny nose and stuffy head all the time from the rhinosinusitis. And they get exacerbations of their disease when they take aspirin or NSAIDs. The reason this happens is because these patients have a dysregulation of arachidonic acid metabolism. And that's why they love to ask you about this, especially on step one, because there's a biochem tie-in. These patients overproduce leukotrienes, and that's what leads to the asthma. Because they overproduce leukotrienes, the treatment of choice is a leukotriene receptor antagonist. So drugs like Montelukast and Zafirculast work very well for patients who have aspirin-sensitive asthma. Symptoms of asthma tend to be episodic, so they tend to be relatively well for a while and then develop lung symptoms, and then with treatment they can go back to normal. The symptoms they get are shortness of breath and wheezing and cough, and it can get severe enough that they can get hypoxic during episodes. One finding in asthma you should know about is called a decreased I to E ratio. So normally the amount of time you spend inspiring to exhaling is about 1 to 2 or maybe 1 to 3. In patients who have asthma, the expiratory phase gets prolonged because it takes longer to get that air past the obstruction. So this ratio can fall and become 1 to 4, for example, or even 1 to 5. So that's a decrease in the ID ratio. Another finding in asthma patients is a reduced peak flow. So this is a peak flow meter right here. It's a very simple device to use. A patient just blows in it and it measures the highest velocity of airflow that they can create. And the peak flow will obviously fall in asthma because there is an obstruction. Patients with asthma can also get mucus plugging, so this can cause airway obstruction and shunting. And then if asthma is severe enough, patients get what's called status asthmaticus, where they become hypoxic and they can die. It's very rare, but this has to be severe, untreated asthma to cause this. Usually we diagnose asthma based on a classic history and physical exam, but sometimes the diagnosis is not clear and there is a test you can do called a methacholine challenge. So recall that methacholine is a muscarinic agonist. It's going to activate the parasympathetic system in the lungs and cause bronchoconstriction. So in a methacholine challenge, you administer increasing amounts of the nebulized drug and you do spirometry after each dose. And you look for the dose at which FEV1 falls significantly. If it doesn't fall, you say the patient is a non-responder and the test is negative. If it falls at a low dose, you call it a positive test and say that that's suggestive of asthma. There are two classic asthma pathology findings that you should be aware of. These are sometimes seen in the sputum of patients with asthma, or sometimes they're discovered at autopsy from patients who die of status asthmaticus. The first finding is called a Kirschman spiral. So patients with asthma often develop mucus plugs, and inside those mucus plugs, you can find Kirschman spirals, like this example I've shown on the screen here. These are epithelial cells that have shed and formed these whorls inside the mucus plug. You also often find eosinophils, and you sometimes find these crystal structures called charco-laden crystals which are made up of eosinophil membrane proteins in patients who have asthma. Pulsus paradoxus is a drop in the systolic blood pressure that occurs with inspiration and I talk about this in detail in the cardiology modules. It's usually caused by a pericardial effusion and tamponade but you should know that there are a few very rare non-cardiac causes of pulsus paradoxus and two of them are asthma and COPD. The mechanism of this is not well understood but just remember that those are the non-cardiac causes of pulsus paradoxus. The final cause of obstructive lung disease is bronchiectasis, and this is the most difficult one to keep straight because it has lots of different etiologies. Bronchiectasis is when the airways become permanently dilated, and this is usually the result of chronic recurrent airway inflammation. If you get lots and lots of bronchial infections, eventually you will get dilated airways and bronchiectasis. That's the consequence of all that disease. Now it seems counterintuitive that when the airways are stretched and dilated, you should have obstruction to flow. But the reason is that even though the large airways are dilated, the small and medium airways have thickened bronchial walls. And most of the bronchial tree is small and medium airways. So the predominant physiologic effect is obstruction, even though when you look at the lungs, what you see are dilated airways.
And these are some pictures of bronchiectasis. So this is a path specimen on the left. And these are big dilated airways that you see in bronchiectasis. Over here on the right is a CAT scan of bronchiectasis. And you can see these big circular dilated airways here. That's what you see in bronchiectasis. Patients with bronchiectasis get recurrent infections. So recurrent pulmonary infections can cause bronchiectasis, but they can also be a consequence of bronchiectasis. These patients have cough and excessive sputum production. It's often foul smelling. They can get hemoptysis, and the hypoxia can lead to core pulmonale, just like many of the other causes of obstructive lung disease. And then finally, bronchiectasis is a rare cause of amyloidosis. So anything that causes chronic inflammation can lead to secondary amyloidosis. We often think of it secondary to things like rheumatoid arthritis, but bronchiectasis can also be a cause. So why do people get these dilated airways in bronchiectasis? Well, one reason is from obstruction from a tumor. So when you have a tumor, you can't clear mucus appropriately, and it backs up behind the tumor. And this sets you up for recurrent infections, and bronchiectasis can develop. Another etiology is smoking. Now, it's not clear if smoking causes bronchiectasis or it just causes recurrent infections and other obstructive lung diseases, and those lead to bronchiectasis. But either way, smoking is associated with bronchiectasis. Kids who have cystic fibrosis get recurrent lung infections and they can develop bronchiectasis. And then finally, two rare causes that you especially need to know for step one are Cartagener syndrome and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, and we'll talk about both of these now. So Cartagener syndrome is part of a group of conditions called primary ciliary dyskinesia. It's also called the immodal cilia syndrome. And people who have this problem have cilia that are unable to beat or beat normally, or they may even be absent altogether. It's inherited usually in an autosomal recessive fashion. And all the gene mutations in these syndromes involve a protein called dianin. Either the structure or formation of dianin is abnormal. And dianin is a very important motor protein that creates movement. Cilia are composed of a series of circular structures called spokes, and then they're connected by all these dianin arms together, and this is what creates the cilia that beat. So what happens in people who have primary ciliary dyskinesia is either the dianin is absent or it's abnormal. There's some problem with the dianin that leads to this condition. Cartagener syndrome is a collection of abnormalities that some patients with ciliary dyskinesia develop. So what are the elements of Cartagener syndrome? First, it's chronic sinusitis from poor ciliary function in the sinuses, bronchiectasis in the lungs with chronic cough and recurrent infections. Men will be infertile because they don't have normal ciliary function in their sperm. And then finally, patients with Cartagener syndrome develop situs inversus, where the organs in the thorax and abdomen are backwards. The mechanism of this is not clear, but it's believed that cilia play some role in proper organ positioning in development. So if you look down here at this CAT scan on the left, the liver here is on the left side of the body. It should be over here on the right, but it's not. In this thorax CT scan on the right, you can see that the heart is on the wrong side of the body as well. So this is what situs inversus looks like. It doesn't carry any abnormal consequences in and of itself. And once in a while, situs inversus is discovered incidentally in someone when they have imaging done. So the classic case of Cartagener syndrome to know about for your boards is usually going to be a child with recurrent sinus or ear infections and a chronic cough. There may be bronchiectasis on a chest CT and obstruction by PFTs. And on imaging, there will be situs inversus. And the question often asks about the dianin protein. So just remember that that is what's involved. The final cause of bronchiectasis that we'll discuss is called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Most people just call it ABPA. This is a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction to the fungus aspergillus. In patients who have this problem, the lungs become colonized with aspergillus fumigatus. This is a low virulence fungus, and it only infects immunocompromised or debilitated lungs. So people who have normal lungs usually get rid of this bug, and it doesn't cause a problem. But if you have sick lungs, you can get this condition. So it's going to primarily occur in patients who have either asthma or cystic fibrosis. What's going on at the immunological level is these patients have increased CD4 counts and they have high levels of interleukins. In their blood, you'll see eosinophilia, and this is a key tip-off that ABPA may be the diagnosis. You'll also see high levels of IgE, and testing for IgE is sometimes done to help diagnose this condition. So the classic case of ABPA is going to be a patient with asthma or cystic fibrosis who has recurrent episodes of cough, fever, and malaise. Now you might think these are just exacerbations of the asthma or CF, but they're going to be a couple of clues that it may be from aspergillus. First of all, they'll tell you there's blood eosinophilia. 
that's very uncommon in those other conditions. They'll also tell you that there's a high IgE level. And then other things you can see are brownish mucus plugs and hemoptysis, bronchiectasis on imaging, or PFTs that show obstruction. You can do skin testing for the fungus to help diagnose ABPA, and you can treat it with steroids to knock down the inflammation of the allergic reaction. So let me finish with a summary slide to help you keep the obstructive diseases straight. There are four causes of obstructive lung disease you should know. Chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, and bronchiectasis. Most emphysema is from smoking, but there is that rare subtype caused by deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then there are a number of causes of bronchiectasis, including obstruction from tumor, smoking, cystic fibrosis, cartagoners, and bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And that concludes our module on obstructive lung disease.